Well, I come from a Ford family, and I was a Ford family all the way until my last car, so. Well, so was I. As a matter of fact, I finally gave my little Mustang to, which it was a Mustang to, to my daughter who lives down in Long Beach. <laughs> but um, I drive a Cadillac now, but the fr when I fr bought an Oldsmobile, my first Oldsmobile, I really had a guilty conscience. <laughs> <laughs> Sacrilege. <laughs> yeah, how could I do that? Be thrown out of the family for that one. <laughs> Now, your name is Loa Underberg? No, Edinburgh. It's uh, two Ds. U D D. Yeah, should I have written that there? Nope, nope. Oh. I, I, uh, uh, Cooley. Right. Okay. Okay. And you grew up where? Here, here in Gig Harbor? Or? Yep. Spent 79 years here now. Really? Except for going to school or in, in the service or something. Wow. Yeah. It, you know, it, it, I'm an old timer. <laughs> it's well. It's rare for me to meet people. My, my dad. Our family's from Olympia forever. Uh -huh. I, I mean, except for school. Uh -huh. Olympia is it. So, but I don't meet many people that uh, have that type of history anymore. Well, there are quite a few in King Harbor, I think. Is that right? The, yeah. the community is. Stayed? Well, especially the families that were involved in the fishing industry, they they stayed here, and at the time, um, there were a lot of. Uh, Scandinavians that moved and they lived in Crescent Valley part of Gig Harbor and the Slavonians lived down in the west side and so those families have kind of hung on in Gig Harbor or all her relatives. <laughs> <laughs> That's Mary Ellen was saying that when she moved here there was the east and the west. Yeah the west side and the east side. Right? <laughs> now the east, the east side really was involved with uh, summer homes mostly um, like cabins but now there are big houses over there, so. It's that, amazing how it's yeah, changed, it's isn't changed. Because it? this was probably considered way out. Well, it was, and you took the ferry to come here, and it uh, wasn't until about the time I graduated from high school that the bridge was built in 1940. So uh, most everything you do was involved in Gig Harbor around your church and your school. <laughs> So, which um, now did you, what area of Gig Harbor did you live in? Going I up? lived down. You know where the shoreline is? Yes. On the hill, right up above it. It's a big white house with a. It's probably it's probably the biggest house in size up there for height. And uh, an architect lives there now. So you lived in town. I lived so in walking distance to any school I went to because you didn't ride a bus. You walked. <laughs> So which, there was a, a elementary school you went to? Yeah, which was Crescent Valley, which is now the Masonic Temple. Same building? or Same building, or? except they've taken one floor off or something. And uh, I went to high school, and they're going to tear that building down. It's, um, in the, it's called Harbor Ridge right now. So it's above uh, Franklin Avenue. What was it when you went there? Was Gig Harbor Union High School. Gig Harbor Union High School. And they didn't have a gym, but it was, one was completed by the time I graduated. Other than that, they had an old community hall, and that's where the guys played basketball. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, when they're because they're going to tear this building down, they had a um, they're having a, they're having the last dance on March second. But they had a thing where the eighth grade took you through and showed you the school and asked you how it was when you were there. And I said, well, it's nice you have lockers. We didn't have any. And they said, what did you do with your coats? I said, we had an open coat room. And then they said, well, what did you do with your books then? And I said, we kept them on our desk in study hall. And they said, we don't have a study hall. <laughs> So it just went on and on, but I think the school is a mess. I'm glad they're tearing it down. It doesn't look very tidy to me. <laughs> <laughs> so you were the, the class of? 1940. 1940. And my husband was 38. 38. And my sister that was in the ways was in 38 also. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, to an older man, your husband. Two years older. Two years you. older than I. <laughs> we were friends for 66 years and married for 53 and a half, and he died last year. Oh, I'm sorry yeah. to hear that. So am I. He's my best friend. That's <laughs> uh, my mom and dad. My we lost my mom about four years, be four years this this March, and same way. 
Uh -huh. They were just the best of... Yeah, I, I used to say, I think we were, we're the Bobsy Twins or something. We don't even go to the grocery store without each other. It's horrible. Uh, so, yeah. as a child here in Gig Harbor, what was... Was there a downtown? Well, kind of what, what Mary Ellen told you was the west side around the bay. That's, there was a theater there. And see... Everything focused really on school because you didn't really, you didn't go to Tacoma unless you had to go there for something and you didn't drive a car so you'd naturally your dad had to take you or something, you know, and uh, so everything really revolved around school and church. And in the summer you picked berries up at Crescent Valley because that's, they raised Logan berries up there. And uh, what else did we do? I don't know. My father finally decided when I was in high school, and I don't remember what year that was, probably I was probably a sophomore, we took a family vote because there were six children in the family and decided that he would, because he was a grocer at heart, his father was a grocer in Gig Harbor and had two or three different stores. And the old Tides Tavern was, was one of my grandpa's store that he opened and my dad ran it when he was 16. So you can see, he would, so he decided maybe we would like to open a little store called the Peninsula Dairy Store next to his Ford agency. Okay, we thought that was a great idea. Never thinking that come summer, we were stuck there all the time, <laughs> evenings after school. Then he decided, I think that you should, we should have a soda fountain in here. So we had to go to the Olympic ice cream shop in Tacoma and learn how to make ice cream. And, Pretty soon he bought an ice cream machine. We were making our own ice cream and going to, <laughs> going to uh, let's see, Almond Roca Place and Haley, uh, whatever their name Brown, is. Brown and Haley. Brown, yeah. yeah. And buying Almond Roca in big containers so we could make Almond Roca ice cream. Then we had the soda fountain. We had a soft ice cream machine. It just went on and on because he just liked us to keep busy. Kept us off the streets or something. <laughs> so he didn't care about making money as long as the kids he were just busy and out of trouble. He didn't want us to be busy. There were five girls and one boy, and the boy was the youngest. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's and a handful. That's true. <laughs> so I, I think Dad uh, kept the, the garage open because you pumped gas in those days until the last ferry came in. <laughs> so not only was the Ford dealer, but... But he had he had a repair place and he had gas pumps. Wow! Huh. So he was just busy. And what was the name of the Ford dealership? It was Edinburgh Motors. <laughs> Sound like hard name to think of, huh? Are, are the buildings? Well, it, right now, you know, the Ford dealership has moved out of downtown, and at that time, this, the building is now. A glass company down in Gig Harbor, it, huh. and the store isn't there anymore because it was torn off years ago. So. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Huh. But anyway, that was fun. Home of the big milkshake, ten cents. <laughs> 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 and, and, and how did Dad pay you? I mean, did he get paid well? I don't remember that we got paid. We had allowances. You know, I don't think you asked for much in those days. You didn't have anything to spend it on anyway. You know. Oh. Was the, so was the the um, soda fountain was soda counter was that a, a hangout for the oh, teenagers? Oh yeah, and, the, and of course they'd all come in. And when I made ice cream, I'd always overcalculate or something, and so I'd pass it out. <laughs> anyway, and then after after that was sold, I think the furnishings in there went to the span. Didn't did you were you aware of the span out by the well? The stools and the counters and all accessories went out there when they first opened the span. So, huh. uh, That's silly. Kind of a neat, well, it's kind of a fun uh, piece of America. Well, I can remember Gig Harbor. I just can't remember the waves. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Do, do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? So that had to be 1941. 41? Am mm -hmm. I thinking? Where was I then? I think I was at the U. I had to be at the U then because I was going to college. So that was a tragic experience. 
you remember what your what what the the feeling was? I mean, did you? Well, it was shock. I think. Seemed to me we were really, everybody just kind of stopped in their tracks and wanted to go listen to what was happening, you know, because you had to get to a radio. So it was it was a sad it was really a sad time. And actually, that's what really started women in the service. Was because World War One, you know, they just said yeoman, yeoman or whatever they called them. <laughs> Uh, most of the women were in that capacity. And I think it was Nimitz, who was a rear admiral at the time, recommended to Congress that they start having women in the service because I think they were short an awful lot of manpower and they needed to release them to other duties. That's why they started the waves. So. What is, do you know what WAVE stands for? I. I, I yeah, I'll tell you, I wrote it down because okay. I never can remember. It's women accepted for volunteer emergency service. <laughs> I want to make it into something else, but it isn't. Because we had uh, uh, some of the WACs, because they originally were the WAA. -A. Yeah, and then they became the WAC. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, I got straightened out by a, a Virginia Britt, wonderful woman in Olympia, straightened me out on when it changed and why, and because and, uh, it was the women's... Auxiliary, yeah, um, army service. Yeah, yeah, and then they cut it down to WAC. Yeah, got rid of the auxiliary. Yeah, yeah. At our wave reunions, some we invite if, if women are around that are war wax or spars or something, we invite them and they come. You know, <laughs> equal opportunity. And uh, at Christmas time, we always bring something to collect for American Lake Hospital for the patients there. That need something like underwear or something. <laughs> what, what were you studying at the U? Nursing. And that was... But, I, but I hadn't, I was just doing the bookwork part of the, you know, because it's a long program. But then uh, when my sister had already graduated from the U and uh, she was working, I think she work, was working at Pier 91 in Seattle and she decided she was going to join the Waves. But she went in as an officer. Well, and I thought, this is a great idea. And while I was going to school, I used to spend my Saturdays down at the Y. And uh, I belonged to something called the Larks. And so you do a lot of activities. And I thought, I could join the Red Cross. Well, and I decided to skip the Red Cross. I think I really don't have anything they need. <laughs> so I decided, I guess I'll join the Waves. Well, that's goofy. My father had all these six people to put through school. and. Uh, uh, I think three grad my my brother graduated. My sister gra was a Navy nurse, and she graduated from uh, Cheney. And uh, uh, one of my other sisters graduated from the U, but I didn't. I didn't go back to school. Because you had just started, and then I had into I had no, I'd been I I was there two years, but um, it was I don't know it was a whim. <laughs> Huh. Wait, so where did you, when you went into the waves, where did you, I, I, I you went to see, camp, I went, oh yeah, oh. I went to Seattle and signed up, and uh, then when I got my orders, I left from, by the train from Union Station in Tacoma, went back to the Bronx, uh, I think we had a layover in uh, Chicago, had to change stations in Chicago for some reason, they have two different stations. But um, so you went to the USO and played ping pong till it's time to leave again. <laughs> and I, I, boot camp was like six weeks, and I was back there in July and that part of the, the hot hot summer. So you were outside part of the time, marching. But there were there were there were Marines that were with you uh, when you did your marching. Kept you on the straight and narrow. Men Marines? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Were they ready for women? I mean, I, I, I've heard of different places where the women went and they, they didn't have uniforms, they didn't have warm. The first group of waves was when Congress finally enacted this bill and President Roosevelt signed it, then I think it was in Iowa where they had at a teacher's college in Iowa where they first had a wave area for training 
but it was too small, and that's why they moved to Hunter. And my sister went to, I think, Radcliffe, uh, because the officers didn't go to, go to Hunter in New York. Uh, and that was in existence, I think, from 42 to 45 before it, they gave up on it. Or they didn't need it anymore because they had women in the regular Navy pretty soon, you know. So what did they, what did, was it school or what, what was it like for boot camp for women? In the Lots of exercising, swimming classes. I think, I can remember one exercise where you crossed your legs, sat on the floor, and you were supposed to be able to stand up, and I never could do that. I'm surprised they didn't kick me out. <laughs> I couldn't do it now either. <laughs> I can I can walk fast, but I couldn't do that. Anyway, um, we did lots of marching. We we did things like um, uh, identification of planes. You watch this on screens and whatnot, and you learned the history of things identification. I think you're supposed to be physically fit and morally straight and whatever, whatever. <laughs> like the Boy Scouts. <laughs> anyway, I enjoyed it. I really did. I, uh, it, when I went to hospital course school, I actually never, the only time I ever worked on wards was in course school. Really? And after that, I was assigned to could you believe, of all things, a newborn nursery? And I did that on a PM shift, I think. And then after that, I worked in the office in outpatient admitting. And the whole time, that's where I was. So where was the newborn nursery? It was, well, the Naval Hospital in San Diego is composed of lots of buildings. They were pink stucco, as I remember. and. Um, it was really a very pretty area there on the hill above the high school, out by Balboa Park. Yes. And uh, so, what was I going to say? So were that were the the newborn? Oh, show, were okay. These from um, uh, pe people that were in the service. Yeah. Uh, it was really kind of strange because the the nursery was connected between two buildings. And the enlisted people's families were in this building, and the officers' family were in that building, and the nursery ran like in between. Strange. Anyway, that's the way it was. But lots of babies. And I did that for quite a while. And then I worked, then as I say, I worked in outpatient admitting, and that was fun. So, what was your, well, I guess. One thing I guess uh, history books don't talk about, I assume there was a little baby boom that happened. Uh, oh, sure there was, yeah. It was, I can remember taking out one baby that was like 13 pounds, and I couldn't believe a baby would be that big. And this lady looked at it and she says, oh, it's ugly, take it back. You know, here I am, this 21-year-old or whatever I was, 22. <laughs> I thought, wasn't that stupid? You know, I don't know. I don't understand people. I think I think I was uh, exposed to a lot of the interesting things that I didn't know existed. <laughs> I was pretty protected from Gig Harbor. I was gonna say, was that your first time <laughs> away from home? Other, and, uh, other than other than you know going to the U. Mm -hmm. Wow, that that had to be. That was some kind of an eye opener. I didn't, you know, as a matter of fact, I really. Uh, I can't remember whether they had uh, black people in the service then or not, because there weren't any at the hospital. And, uh, and w one of the girls that I was quite friendly with was from South Carolina, and I remember getting on a bus with her. I remember getting on a bus, and it really upset her if black people would sit near her. And you know, I didn't understand that. I had people in my chemistry class at the U that didn't bother me any, for goodness sake, what did they do to anybody? <laughs> it, you know, they had a different outlook on life than we in this part of the country do. But I, I that's slowly changing, I hope. I think that kind of goes to show that the prejudice is a learned... Uh, it is. Yeah. It is learned. They were brought up that way. And 
I, I never could understand it, but I, I, when I think back on it, I can see why they were that way, but I thought it was disgusting myself, you know. <laughs> you know, we really uh, had people that weren't of any other race, really, in Gig Harbor. Why? Probably be, be, because um, there weren't any jobs here. It was just kind of a rural area with farming and whatnot, and, and there wasn't anything for people to do over here, you know, no industry. So, so yeah, I was never exposed to people of other races till I went to school away, you know. And that's one interesting aspect of, uh, of World War II, what it did to, to change the, uh, the race boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people from the South came out, uh, got decommissioned at Fort Lewis or Bremerton or whatever, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we've mixed things up more. And, and, yeah, uh, so it's probably, well, that's a good aspect of it. <laughs> the war wasn't good. But, yeah. Well, I have a nephew now that's an admiral. Oh, is that right? Yeah, my sister Shirley's son is an admiral, a rear admiral. Wow. Where, where is he uh, stationed, do you know? Oh, yeah, back in Virginia. As a matter of fact, he's in California now giving speeches. I think he's going to be up here this week, the next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> but I am going to Kansas. Kansas? Kansas. I have a daughter who lives in Kansas. Well, the wizard said, why would anyone want to go to Kansas? That's what I told her when she went there. <laughs> she's a trend merchandiser, so she travels all over the world. But anyway, the company she's with was in uh, Kansas. and. Uh, I said, Carolyn, why would you want to live there? That's Wizard of Oz country. <laughs> you know? But you know something, it's rather pretty. Mm -hmm. uh, she only lives, she lives in Olathe, which is like 30 miles from the uh, airport in Kansas City, Missouri. And it's really a very pretty area. It's like anywhere. I mean, you go eastern Washington versus western Washington, you can find areas of Washington that are not, not yeah. as interesting. But. Well, I used to think the Pacific Northwest was the only place to live, but the more you travel, the more you, <laughs> you see other places you wouldn't mind living. So, so was, was your husband in the service? Yes. What, what, what branch was? Navy, naturally. But anyway, I knew, like I said, I already knew him in Gig Harbor. <laughs> but he was in the first battle in the Philippine Sea, and, and uh, he spent most of his time out in that area, really. All of his time. W were you boyfriend girlfriend at, at that time? We dated. We had dated. We were just. We grew up in the Methodist Church together and <laughs> sort of belonged to Everett League and all that stuff. So we were just friends. You know, a, a lot of the th kids didn't date as much in Gig Harbor. They went. And our church group went around in a group all the time. We did fun things together. We went swimming. We had beach parties that were beach parties. They weren't whatever parties. You know, and so. Uh, we just really had a great time. We had a lot of camaraderie, I guess you'd say. Did you keep in touch with him while he was oh, in yeah. the service? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Writing letters yeah. back and forth? I, I wrote letters. Uh, one of the fellows in Gig Harbor was a prisoner of war, and um, he was taken on Wake Island. I used to write to him, too. Kenny? Yeah. yeah. Kenny Marvin? Yeah. 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 He was nice a, guy. Yeah. The interesting, mm -hmm. we interviewed a gentleman. Uh, about three years ago, four years ago now, he passed away. But Kenny and uh, Kenny had a picture of him standing next to uh, S uh, Sandy, Sandy Sanders, uh, Jacob Sanders, I think was his real name, but Sandy Sanders, and okay. they both had been in all four prisoner of war camps together. Mm -hmm. So it was really strange. the The ship that took him over to Wake Island, one of Kenneth's classmates was was an officer on that ship, and they, they, he got together with Kenny while they were on the ship, you know. <laughs> and, and then he said, and Kenny would say, "Cooley, what did you? I mean, uh, Secor, what did you leave me over here for? You know, <laughs> look what happened to me." Yeah. It sort of changed things, didn't it? I mean, it did. in, in our country, in a lot of ways. Uh, I mean young men that went away, young women that got in the service, it changed the work environment. Uh, women now, uh, Rose of the Riveters, and, and uh, so do you think there was, a, besides the, the, the travesty, besides the negative part of war, was there a positive effect on, on the world from 
World War II, you think? Or, or well, there had to be to a certain aspect because you, you changed your opinions about a lot of things. You met a lot of different people. Uh, you weren't so isolated in a way. You were kind of more open. I think I, it, it, it changed. Did you have any um, Japanese students at the U with you? Have oh, you? uh huh. So how was that? I mean, was there that? Oh, oh these are. Oh, you mean after? Yeah. Well, oh. yeah. Uh, uh, just prior to Pearl Harbor, when you started. I don't really think. I never thought anything about people. I accept people as people. So, I don't really have any prejudices about anything. Because they aren't always the people at fault either, you know. I mean, the people that you see. <laughs> That's I was asking the Kenny if he holds any animosity, and he says, "No, no, it was a." He it said he got whacked in the teeth a couple times, but he asked for it. He was, <laughs> you know, he, he's a character. <laughs> I, he was a year ahead of me in high school. He, he grew up here too. <laughs> so. Gig Harbor was a was a farming and fishing community. Is that what it was? Probably? Yeah, it was, and it was really spread out. Like um, there were grade schools all over in these little uh, areas where people had kind of congregated, and so the high school annual was called Perklawan, and it stood for Purdy, Elgin, Lincoln, which was Lincoln School down here in Gig Harbor, Crescent Valley. And it just went on and on. That's how the annual got its name was because of all these little grade schools that were located here. Oh, wow. And there weren't any, I, I bet there were about, I don't think there were any more than three or four buses when I was a kid because if you lived in walking distance of school, you walked to school. And the, the kids said, where did you, did you have a cafeteria in the school? And I said, no. They said, where did you have lunch? And I said, most people brought a sack lunch, but I went home for lunch. And they said, where did you go? And I said, just down the street here. And they said, we can't leave the school crowd. And I said, well, we're on honor to go and come. Didn't matter to anybody in those days. You know, actually, I think that the rules your parents set down were the rules you abided by. And so consequently, most people, somebody said, you have to be back in an hour. You were back in an hour, you know. It was a different world. It's probably also. I mean, with the community being as small as it was. If everybody you, knew what everybody was doing, that's for sure. And if you were a half an hour when you were supposed to be back in class, your parents probably heard about it before you got home. Oh, they would. Yeah. <laughs> well, my father always came home for lunch, so he was always there, too. You know? <laughs> oh, dear. Was it a, a better time? I mean, I guess that's kind of a hard question, but what, the, the time that you grew up versus the times that are there now, was it a... I don't know, because my time was occupied all the time, and it, most kids were, because if, if you lived on a farm, I'm sure that you, were, you did work on the farm, and so your time was occupied. Um, you didn't have transportation that you ran around in, in, you know, maybe some kid in high school would have a car and everybody would ride to the lake and go swimming or something, but, <laughs> you know, it was, it, you were really co more confined. I think the most dreadful thing that could happen to you was if you got on the ferry and went to a movie in Tacoma and it got foggy and they canceled the ferry run, you had to sit on the dock, then you didn't have any way to call your folks and say well, where you were, you know. <laughs> that was a stupid thing. It'd be a long, cold night. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember if the war uh, affected your dad's um, auto dealership? You know something? I really never gave it any thought. I don't know. I should ask my younger sister that. <laughs> she was around more. Uh, yeah. He probably didn't get the, the ma cars manufactured here. You know, there used to be a Ford plant in Seattle mm. when I was younger, because I used to go over there with him sometimes. But they did away with that one, so everything had to come out of Detroit. But when I came back from the service, I just worked in his office. And then when I got married, I had three ki children, and I didn't go back to work until they were in high school. So I worked as a supervisor in medical records at Tacoma General for 21 years. Wow. So, so you stayed 
I mean, except for the time of, of staying home and raising children, you stayed within the, the medical industry that you'd been trained for. That's right. Mm -hmm. huh. Did you enjoy your time in the service? Was yeah, it I did. a good experience? Yeah. You did. It was, you know, it was a, a nice area. You were, your time was well occupied. If you were a person that was interested in sports, you did that in your spare time. Um, there were, there was usually a lot to do. Uh, this, like I said, the San Diego High School was below us. Sometimes uh, they'd have good plays down there. Even Helen Hayes came at one time and was in a play that was down there. So you, you just did everything you just ordinarily did when you were in, at home. So, wasn't much different. Were the the women protected, and by that I mean from the uh, military men? I mean, were you? You had your own barracks, and uh, well, you were on a compound that uh, there that had uh, ships. I mean, ship service and laundry and all that sort of thing, but. Uh, you, had, you, you only went on liberty if you had liberty hours, you know, <laughs> same as they did. Did they, did they try, because, you know, the movies you always see, and there's all these romances, and these men that have been out in the jungle for like eight years, and they come back, and they're wild. Well, they were all patients, you know, they're in their own buildings. <laughs> so, they, uh, when I worked on wards, I was, I was really quite kind of a shy person, I think I was. Anyway. They would tease me. They called me Sunshine because I didn't talk so much as I do now. They, I just smiled. <laughs> so did you did you deal with some uh, wounded soldiers there? Were, were there no no no? Huh. The war the war, I, like I said I was only on wards d when during the hospital corps school part of it. Huh. So. And, and what was your your rank when? I was a pharmacist third. He graduated from course school as a hospital apprentice first class or something. <laughs> it's really strange. <laughs> so did they, when you got in, did they kind of pick and choose what you went to do? They told you, you didn't have any, any control over that. You know, and actually the Hollywood people came down and uh, they'd come down to the auditorium and put on shows. Jose Aturbi do card trips and play the piano, tricks and play the piano. And, and uh, all, different, different uh, people would come down and entertain the patients and then you would push them up there in their wheelchairs and, and so they could watch the, what was going on. They, they, were, they were well entertained at that time if that was possible. I can remember when I was first there and they had Fourth of July celebrations down there. It bothered some of the patients that had been in Iwo or somewhere, you know, because all these things going off really upset them. So, but they soon got over that. It, it was kind of hard on them. Yeah, it seemed to, to to have affected everybody differently. You know, so the people that came back. That in fact, I have a friend that, that uh, um, her father, to the, still to today, the 4th of July, he goes away because... He doesn't like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, working in the outpatient department, you were an outpatient admitting, and of course people came in, had lab work done. If they had some strange malady, you would report them to the city of San Diego so they would be kept track of. Uh, Everything was an eye opener to me. I was a kid from the country. You know. <laughs> that, that, that's amazing. So you reported them to the city of San Diego. Yeah, she had to report them to the health department. Mm -hmm. So that would be like somebody with post traumatic or something like no, that. No, pe people with syphilis or gonorrhea or oh, something. Oh, oh, they had oh. a bad lab report. <laughs> Boy, could you imagine that today? The, the, the outcry. People you know, had. that's the, so, the thing I think about with AIDS. Isn't it too bad that they can't be reported? Because everybody has a right so they don't get reported on, <laughs> on things like that. But in those days, you reported people that had a venereal disease. Wow. To the uh, city? To the, to the health department, because they kept track of them. Saw that they had their 
whatever they took to help them out. <laughs> it, 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 I mean, it, it speaks volumes for the difference. I mean, back today you read, you know, Joe Blow got arrested for da 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 da. Back then, I can see the paper report. Oh, Joe Blow has syphilis. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I don't think they'd say that, but anyway, it, that was a private thing. You'd have to, you'd have to call them up, and say. You have a, a lab report that needs repeating, and so you'd invite them to come in and have another lab work done, and then they would get reported to the health department huh. if they had a positive. And of course, then you had to type up if people were transferred to another area or a family was transferred, then you had to be sure that you had to type up their reports and get them off to wherever they were going. So. They were really retirees or families of service people or service people that were directly connected with the hospital that, that were there. That's it. Whoever, did I talk to you on the phone or your brother? Uh, I talked to my brother. Yeah. I was telling him about this one patient that his name was Petros Protoprotodicus, and he was a retired chief. And he. He uh, wanted to know where I came from, and I said, oh, I come from the Seattle area. Where in the Seattle area? Well, I really come from the Tacoma area. Where in the Tacoma area? Um, I come from Geek Harbor. Well, I know where Geek Harbor was. I was stationed in Bremerton for years. And I said, well, he says, uh, so he called me. He called me Tacoma after that. He came in and said, hi, Tacoma. And he's, he's, like I said, very elderly gentleman because he told me, he was on the Lexington when it gave lights to the city of Tacoma. Well, when they gave lights to the city of Tacoma, if you look at the little history of Tacoma, it was 1929. Well, I was seven then. <laughs> but so, he, you know, he's a lot older than I was. He's a retired chief. Anyway, so uh, he came in one day and says, Tacoma, I've changed my name. And I said, well, what did you change it to? And he said, Petros FDR. Protopropodicus, wears this black morning band on his arm, that's what he changed his name <laughs> Anyway, I'll never forget that name because it was such an interesting experience. <laughs> oh, gee. Uh, it's, it's, it, I mean, it sounds like you had lots of uh, different educations within the, oh, you did. your time. With it. That's true. And then when, so when did you leave the service? 1946. You only signed up for the duration of the emergency and six months. And so as soon as my time came up, I left. They wanted you to stay and they'd up you to a second class or something and I decided to skip it. I'm not going to stay. <laughs> Everybody else left. Everybody else is coming home. I think I'll go home. <laughs> did you keep in touch with, I mean, did you make friends within the, the service? That you yeah, I, I, I made some friends. And uh, and then when I came back, one of the gals was from Tacoma. And uh, then I met her sister, who was also a wave. And, uh, and she just died like two years ago, I guess it was. But she's the one that set up this for us to uh, always have our get-togethers at the Elks Club. But I... Other than that, most of the friends that I maintain are from Tacoma General, really, now. Because all those people are in other places, you know. They so. had 20 years of working at Tacoma General. I imagine you met lots of yeah. people over there. Yeah, right. So, all the doctors I knew then, I've been retired since 1988. 88. That's a long time ago. I said. See, that's why I can't remember this wave stuff because I was probably, I was young at the time, 57 years ago. I know it's amazing because we, we, uh, we lose perspective of it, mm -hmm. you know, when it was. You know, I really, for a long time, I had, you know, the, the little pamphlet or flyer that was put out telling what the news of the base was when you were at boot camp. And I had all those things, but I don't know where they are. I haven't the slightest idea. We can only keep stuff so long. I know, and I'm still sorting. <laughs> I want all my kids to take everything that belongs to them, you know. <laughs> well, you do like my dad did. He uh, he had a rule for a while was when he stopped by, there were going to be boxes, and you had to take one with you. I did that when when my dad died, 
and, and my mother had all these things from all these different kids in the house. I said, these are yours, and if you don't take them, they're going to be gone because I'm in charge of cleaning out everything. <laughs> now I've got to do it to myself. <laughs> it's hard. A lot of yeah. you don't want to get rid of stuff, but then again. That's true. Yeah. Hmm. But now I mow lawns. <laughs> it's it's a lonesome time, really. That's yeah. the hardest part, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. That's my dad is exactly your age, and, and uh, your, your health-wise seem to be in great health, and, and uh, he is uh, he's had uh, heart problems, and and but now it's um uh it's still. He says the hardest part is is to go home between because he still goes to work every day. Oh, that's good. And but between dinner time. But he can't be my age then. No, he is. Yeah. He's seventy nine. Oh, okay. Yep. Just turned seventy nine, January second. Well, that's and neat. He owns a, an office complex and and uh, uh, he has other people. Yeah. Run it, but he's in there every day. Doing well, that's some, that's good. That's really healthy. Yeah. yeah, it is. But now it's uh, it's the dilemma that he faces of, you know, he tells us that he's lonely, and you know, we try to do all four, three of the four boys live in town, mm -hmm. and uh, we try to do what we can with them. But there's a certain point where, you know, you yeah. hang out with somebody other than your kids. You know, it's that's like, true. But dad, you need to. But yeah. it's, it's challenging. It is. Yeah. I know. I need to do some volunteering. And my sister volunteers here, and she volunteers at orthopedic. So I don't like to go to either of those two places. I guess I could go, <laughs> I go to the hospital and volunteer.